Clippers, we're just, I, I think Doc and I are just not as manly as you are, I guess. No, I guess not. I mean, <laughs> sissies. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave. You guys come back to me next week and let me know yeah. if you sort of worked through your problem. Welcome to the Backward Compatible Halloween Spooktacular. This week, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss tension, fear, and dread in games, and the importance of immersion and investment in creating those feelings. Plus, impressions of Fear the Walking Dead and the Tales from the Borderlands finale. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 49 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And I'm joined by Jim. Hey, everybody. Happy Halloween. Yes, today is our spooktacular. Scared. Uh, Insert a, scary music here. Is that? Okay. More or less. At least the sound effects. Probably less. <laughs> Uh, but our meaty topic of discussion today, quite appropriately for the spooktacular, is to uh, talk about, uh, let's see here, suspense, horror, and fear in games. Uh, we had a sort of similar discussion last time on our spooktacular. It's already been a year since then, which is interesting. Uh, um, it was a shorter it discussion was a, it was last a, time. Yeah, it was more our icebreaker. Today it's going to be the meaty topic. So uh, before we get into that, let's go ahead and open up with the button mosh. Ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, uh, for me personally, I've really just been playing more Metal Gear Solid 5, so here. <laughs> I won't talk too much about that. Um, if you guys Thank want goodness. to go back and, <laughs> and listen to, I believe it was, was it Podcast 47? Yeah. Where Chris and I sort of gushed about Metal Gear Solid 5. Um, just to say, I'm still playing, I'm, I'm a bet about mission 30 five or six, I think, and I'm at about 64 minutes, 64 hours rather in the game, so I'm only at about 40, 41%, I think, I'm trying to remember. Um, so obviously I've got a lot more to go, so I'm still having a blast. Uh, Chris, what have you been playing? So I just played the finale of Tales from the Borderlands, uh, and it was really, 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 really good. That is a highly academic way of putting it. Um, that was like 10 really <laughs> I think I think the more realists you say they start canceling each other out after yeah <laughs> there you go um, but that but in all seriousness um, it is I think my favorite telltale series thus far and that's not just because I'm a fan of Borderlands I think this is some of their best work really um, it has one of the coolest payoffs for your decisions throughout the game uh, that comes through in a very tangible way um, without revealing too much, there's kind of this final thing that you're about to do, and you get to form a team in addition to your two main characters and their kind of like closest party. You get to bring on three additional people to help you. And the people who are available to you um, are based on uh, what you did throughout the story. So, um, say for instance, if you killed someone off, they might not be available to help you. Or if you... Um, alienated someone they won't be available to help you mm. and so your final team will vary not only on what your choice is um which is cool that you do get to choose but also that it's affected by your uh the way you approach the story throughout um so it's <clears throat> excuse me uh really like well written um well produced game i think overall one of telltale's best works in my opinion would you would you say for someone that um just really isn't that interested in the Borderlands universe, mm -hmm. didn't really get into the Borderlands universe, that this, that Tales from the Borderlands would still have some interest? I think it could. Um, and I think it's certainly, like, even if they think they were sort of intrigued by um, Borderlands in general but weren't into the gameplay, um, it brings forth the sort of classic Borderlands style of humor, the sort of dark humor mixed in with, um, well... I think dark comedy kind of says it <laughs> uh, in general. It's um, It's got a lot of humor to it, but it's also got a lot of good character development, that sort of thing. Um, you start off, you know, when they announced that there are just going to be side characters that you're playing as and not necessarily. There were cameos from characters from the main series, but they weren't the focus. Um, so, they're new, so they're mostly new characters. Mostly so. new characters. And by the time you get to the end of the series, 
you're like saying it's like, oh man, they should totally put this character into Borderlands Three as a playable character because they endear you to them so much. So sure. Um, the other thing that I really liked about it is uh, they had sort of different theme songs for each episode, um, and while some of them sort of stick in your head better than others, um, sometimes those songs or the ending credits themes, that sort of thing. Um, they're really good with their choice of music, kind of the right punch. It uh, has just the right sound in the right moment. Um, just overall, the the construction of these episodes was excellent. Cool. And and also, the just out of curiosity, too, because I actually was warning you about this as well, because it's called Tales from the Borderlands. Mm-hmm. Is it like each episode is a separate tale, and they come together at the end? Or is no, it it's one long story. It's one story, okay. but with two protagonists. So you switch back and forth between. So that's oh, interesting. okay. So, yeah. yeah. The Tales title actually comes from Monkey Island, mm-hmm. which is... Arguably, the the loosest. It doesn't follow the same format because it is most assuredly um, reminiscent of the old Scum engine from the Monkey Island games. Yeah, but they called it Tales of Monkey Island. I remember that, and honestly, did you play that? Was, yeah, did yeah, you I play the original it. Monkey Island game? Yeah, because I, 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 I really didn't like the Tales of Monkey Island, and maybe that's, that's yeah, I liked it. It's one of my favorites. Really? Yeah. Maybe that's something we should talk. We should talk about at some point. Maybe we can have a. Uh, I don't know if you, if you played Monkey Island, Chris. I have not. Maybe we can do a Monkey Island Codex talk at some point. Ooh. Go back, talk about the whole series, talk about the remakes. Well, stick a pin in it. Yeah, talk about the new one. Could be fun. We might actually touch on that a little bit on our um, interactive fiction one, too, since I'm sure the topic of uh, what Telltale's doing will come up. It's definitely going to come up in a minute whenever I do some back talk. I think so. I think that technically what Telltale's doing is... Um, not quite the same as the interactive fiction that we're talking about, but it is, it is an adjacent space, so it does have some relevance there. Yeah, save it for the codex. <laughs> Coming soon to backward compatible. Uh, okay, so uh, Doc, what have you been playing this week? Well, you know, I decided to pick up and finish Outlast, which is a game that I think I talked about many, many, many episodes ago, probably one of my very first episodes hmm. on the podcast. Um, for those who uh, don't know or don't remember, basically you've got this reporter, Miles. He's given a hot tip. He goes to an old asylum with his camera, and that's it. There are no... Oh, I saw I, this. Yes. Yeah, there are no guns yes. in the game. Uh, the core mechanic, once you get far enough in, and, and I'm telling you, about halfway through the game is whenever you really have to start fearing for your life. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the scares don't come from the asylum inmates. They actually come from the environment. Um, but every now and then one will chase you and if he catches you, he will kill you. Um, so what you have to do is you have to run and you have to hide and you have to wait for him to go away. And the really cool thing about that is because they were taking advantage of some of the new PS4 stuff, cause it was an early PS4 game. Mm-hmm. Um, things like running through a puddle of blood will leave footprints and, uh, they can follow the footprints. Yeah. They can follow the footprints. The more you run, the longer miles is going to, uh, pant. And we're talking really great sound effects. If you want the full effect, Mm. put on some headphones. Because he's going to be hiding under a bed, and the thing, by all rights, should, you know, by any game mechanic prior to this, you would figure you're hiding, you're in a hiding place, you're safe. But no, he's still going, (laughs) and the thing finds him. Yeah. Um, So So it's terrifying. Is this, and you said it's for PS4. PS4. So It's also on on PC. You can get it on Steam. Okay. In fact, it originally came out on Steam. I'm probably going to check that out. It sounds interesting, and that's... Um, one that I think is relate, related to our, our spooky-themed episode. Absolutely. So that's a very good one to play. Um, and I think it's effective. And, and when we get to our meaty topic in a minute, we'll, we'll talk about why it is that I think it's effective. Yeah. Can, we, can we say that this week uh, we don't have a meaty topic? We have a, uh, like a decomposed meat topic, like zombified. A rotten and topic. Yeah, <laughs> like just so that it's, it's, it's spookier that way. We have a bowl of grapes topic, you know, because it's like those peeled peel grapes. Peel grapes yeah, okay. Like okay. This week in gaming history. Uh, today we had a couple of, of milestones in gaming history. Um, on October 18th, 1985, the NES, uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, launched here in the U.S. And um, unlike in Japan, it, which we talked about in July, it launched with uh, some pretty big games. Uh, the biggest one obviously being Super Mario Brothers. Um, also, it launched with uh, Duck Hunt, Excite Bike, Mock Rider, Kung Fu, a whole bunch of games. Um, I know it was a big part of my uh, childhood growing up. Um, particularly when I got it, I had the uh, Super Mario Brothers and the Duck Hunt pack combined pack together. But, but yeah, that was like a huge that was like a huge part for me. So um, obviously, it sort of helped bring the game industry back after the uh, you know the crash from um, 
Atari and all the Western developers sort of kind of running away and hiding from the industry for a while. And Pinto kind of came in and was able to um, fill in that empty space and kind of, you know, save the industry. Um, do y'all have any that you want to add related to Nintendo before we... Only that the Teddy Rux pin is responsible for Nintendo and probably video games being as successful as they were. Because they did not think that a toy mm-hmm. like the NES would be successful. And oh, right, yes. That Christmas, they said, you know what? We will, we will put out your toy, um, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is why they changed the name. Right, Because right. it's an entertainment system. You remember, it came... video games were a dirty word. Yes, right. I remember hearing yeah. about and, this. And it, came, yes. and it came boxed with the robot. Remember, remember well, Robbie the Robot? Rob. Rob, yeah. Rob, yeah. And, um, I think it was like, what, Robot Operating Buddy? Right. Yes, I think so. And he had, had like... Was it, was it Gyromite that it came yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, which is a terrible game. Yeah, <laughs> um, but, it was. <laughs> but because you've got this robot that plays games, and you've got this teddy bear that sings songs, they were on the shelf next to each other. And uh, that's the reason why the NES was so very popular hmm. that year. I think that was more the reason why the stores were able to sell it. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that why that's why it's the most was so popular. Well, you're absolutely right. But but I mean if it wasn't for Teddy Ruxpin, it wouldn't have been in stores. Like right. you're saying. That's exactly so what I'm so saying. which is very true, and it wouldn't have been anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um because retailers were terrified of selling video games. Yeah. So that's that's I mean that's pretty cool. And then um was this Teddy anything like Tickle Me Elmo in far as popularity or was it a Oh yeah. It was sure. extremely yeah. popular. Yeah. Um, I, had, Patch I had one. I had Teddy Ruxpin. I mean it was it was right up there. You, yeah. you popped the tape into his back and mm-hmm. then he told the story along with your book that you had. Yeah, mm-hmm. he read along with you. About him. It was very meta. Mm-hmm. He was he was really kind of self absorbed when you think about it. He was <laughs> his yeah, he was he was a real selfish dude. <laughs> tell me tell me one about someone else, Teddy. Yeah. I don't want to hear about your adventures anymore. What I'd rather hear is you uh because I think we had a couple of those things like the uh, Douglas the fir tree or whatever, uh, where oh, yeah. the, the mouth would move with along with the tape. That's yeah. what it did. Well, that's, what it did. Uh, that's what it that's did. That's what it did. But then, uh, like, you pop into something completely different, and like suddenly your tree is like rapping or something like that, which yeah. is hilarious. Jim, you popped in your Metallica tapes, didn't you? Uh, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> definitely. Uh, later on, yeah. Sure. Um, so, and then the other one, the other release that I wanted to mention, a few days later after. Um, you know, Japan, Nintendo of America launched the NES in the U.S. Um, Sega launched the Mark III um, on the 21st in 1985. And the Mark III, we know it here as the Master System, didn't hit the U.S. until a year later. Um, but uh, the, master, the Master System that we got here in the U.S. had the, same, the exact same guts as the Mark III in Japan. Later, they had a new version that they called Master System, but it was actually different. It was an upgraded version. Mm. And was uh, that Master System the same as the Genesis? No, okay. It's the precursor. It's the. Okay. It's essentially the eight bit, just like the Genesis mm. was the same generation as the, the Super NES. Nintendo. Yeah. yeah, this is the same generation as the NES. Makes sense. So you know, it had it, its big claim to fame was it tried to do a lot of arcade ports. So it had things like a more accurate arcade version of Double Dragon. It had, which by the way was a terrible game. <laughs> Um, it had Shinobi, which was actually a pretty good port. It had like Space Harrier. Um, then it had some other games like Hang On, Fantasy Star, which was one of the first um, our console RPGs that we actually ended up getting in America. It was, I think those was the first that we got in America, hmm. console RPGs. Um, and then, of course, it had um, the original Sega mascot, the one that really should have stuck around because Sonic was, was just uh, <laughs> so obnoxious. And that was um, Alex Kidd. I don't know if you remember any any Alex. I think Kidd I think vaguely, games, but, yeah, uh, yeah. But that was the original Sega mascot. I but the thing is, though, that. yeah. But you got to go fast, and that's why he didn't stick around. Probably so. Well, he was he, he was the thing is he was uh, another platforming character, and mm-hmm. it was a little bit too close to Mario, I mm-hmm. guess. But did he require blast processing? You see, uh, you have Sonic you because you need blast processing. Well, there was they did actually end up porting uh, the first Sonic the Hedgehog to the Master System. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, backward compatibility, right? There, yeah, there you go. Advertising works, people. <laughs> Advertising works. Uh, n- another little interesting tidbit, right before we move on here, um, you could actually take your uh, uh, your Master System controllers and you could plug them into an Atari and you could play. <laughs> really? And you could do the reverse. Wh- why? Because they use the same pins, like the exact same setup, like the, the, the little pins on the controllers huh. or the inputs were totally the same so you could you could swap the master system controller into a different into the atari 2600 fun facts by jim yes okay so <laughs> just a little thing this is back talk where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed doc you have a response to 
some things that I may have said in podcast 47 when you were um, absent. Yeah, and the great thing about it is that uh, Chris has just helped my case by the game that he was playing this week and openly calling it a game. (laughs) The Telltale uh, series was... Uh, rather rudely bashed a couple of episodes ago. Okay, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to be fair, I did. I specifically multiple times said I wasn't bashing it. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I specifically did, said it's not a bash. All right, it's fine. just a. It's just a different terminology, different different term that I wanted to use for it. That's it. To be fair, you are correct. And now we'll, we'll um, be silent. But um, what I want to do is simply assert that it is in fact a game. Uh, the definition of games that. Um, I used to use whenever I taught game design was that a game is something that has defined space, defined elements, defined win conditions, and defined rules. And I think by that definition, uh, we can say that all IF is a game. Interactive fiction is a game. And so even if it falls on a spectrum between uh, text-only games and games that have a graphical interface and are more mechanics, which is the old debate. This is the old debate from the, gosh, the 70s and 80s. Is it game or is it story? Or is it story or is it game? And there were two camps. You had writers who were using that as a tool, and you had game designers who, in order to get their game out there, needed to tell the story. And finally, we realized it's a, it's a spectrum. And some of us who've uh, pushed it further than that have argued that it's a two-by-two, two, meaning there's a second, you know, a, a y-axis on the spectrum. And that that is, well, a lot of people call it different things. I, I've always called it authenticity and validity which is basically the idea of uh, who has control over that story or who has control over those mechanics. And so am I, am I giving, as a designer, the palette to the player or am I keeping it to myself? Is the character, the main character, someone you're going to be able to design, like in an RPG? Uh, is the story something that's going to have decisions, whether they be forking or foldback? Or is it something that I'm going to retain a narrative authority of and in so retain the validity of that story? Uh, we don't we don't mess with Shakespeare. Shakespeare is Shakespeare, right? Unless you're Baz Luhrmann, and then you, you said it in modern times. Um, but <laughs> or you make a what was it? A, not even no fear Shakespeare, but like the even newer ones where it's like yeah, like, the modern translation. It's got yeah. like text phrases and stuff yeah. like that. Well, you know, I'm okay with that as long as it's side by side because it really is an old language. It's a I mean, you got you got 500 years between us and mm-hmm. them. You got to translate the thing. But uh, regardless, what I'm saying is that. Uh, I really think that there's something to be um, acknowledged that this is in a a game space. And when we we deny that it's in a game space, we lose something. Now, we can argue that it is not heavily ludic, but to say that it's not a video game um, is... It's almost inappropriate. Okay. I mean, I I wouldn't say inappropriate. (laughs) I just think... You're inappropriate! (laughs) No, it's a different... I I don't think... I will say just generally. Should we watch again? <laughs> oh, and this is not a this is not a, a not so much like a rebuttal to what you're saying. It's not that general. I'm responding. It's that no, I'm no, talking. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's a general note because I wanted to to put a pin in something else related to this, but less so a broader like what is a game topic, but more of a um, genres in games mm-hmm. and looking at them less from a because right now a lot of our genres are focused either purely on a mechanic side mm-hmm. or on um boy to movies like it'll be something like an action or an adventure it's like these are like movie genres or it'll say oh it's a platformer which is like purely based on the mechanics yeah so maybe maybe we could have a more nuanced discussion of of genre using something like um you know some sort of like a like charts and matrixes and try to really kind of figure out where they fall in some of these uh that might give us an idea about what we could what we could say like these different experiences, like something like an interactive narrative from a Telltale game, compared to something like uh, Tetris, you know, like very different experiences. But they're both, um, at least uh, from what you're saying, you would consider them both games. So yeah. mm-hmm. where do we put those in terms of like, because they're very different. If you're saying, if you say, I like video games, okay, well, here's Tales from the Borderlands and here's Tetris. Mm-hmm. Like that person that says, I like video games may not, like he might think, Tales from the Borderlands is what I like, or he might think Tetris is what I like. Yeah. So you're not really giving him information when you say, oh, here's a video game. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So right. it's like, just like if someone says, I like movies, and you hand them, uh, you know, 
I don't know, My Little Pony, the movie or something, he's going to be like, <laughs> or maybe he loved it. Or maybe he's like, whoa, this is awesome. Or maybe he's going to go, this is not, this is, what the hell is this? Are, so, are we talking the old movie from the 80s, the modern series, or Equestria Girls? You know what, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but I, 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 I would like to put a pin in that because maybe that's yeah. something that we could talk about in, in a greater depth. Absolutely. At some point. And to close the circle on this discussion, um, I would say, uh, I haven't played Tales of the Borderlands, so it's a bad one for me to use. Um, but, uh, I'm really interested in the tales of Minecraft that has just come out. Oh, uh, Minecraft story mode? Yeah. Minecraft story mode. It's interesting because I'm actually kind of interested in that too, and I'm not really a fan of Minecraft, but yeah. I'm curious to see how they approach that. So what you've got is, is a game space, arguably, mm-hmm. that is uh, extremely authentic, and it, and it leaves everything to the player with mm-hmm. no story at all, really, um, and also gives all the tools to the player. So you, you've got that, and that's Minecraft. And then now what they've done is they've taken away pretty much all the agency and control that they can within the context of a linear narrative. And I don't even know if there's a building mechanic anymore. Yeah. Um, and God, if there is, it's probably like quick time events for like you are building yeah. something. Right, exactly. But it doesn't play like Minecraft. It's abstracted out into the story. And, and that's a good example of a very, another totally different, you know. But they genre. exist within the same world, arguably. Yeah. So what they've done is they've gone to the extreme opposite end of mm-hmm. both spectrums, both the story game spectrum and also the authenticity validity spectrum. Um, so yeah, I'm going to make a point to, to play that one and, and report back. Mm-hmm. Maybe future out mm-hmm. Yeah. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So recently I got in the mail a couple of different games that I... Um, A couple of our uh, competitors, you might say, on Kickstarter about the time that we were running the genre Kickstarter campaign um, that I also happened to back. Our game was better. (laughs) Sure. No, it really wasn't. Uh, (laughs) It's still a good game. It's just a very different game. Uh, But the two games I got in recently are in what is now called the dystopian universe, which we've discussed how I don't like that being an adjective. Oh, yes. Um, But anyway. (laughs) um, Our game was better. But it's in the same universe as uh, The Resistance and Coup. Um, and in fact, one of the games is called Coup Rebellion G54. Um, and is that just so that for people that are searching and also for me, because I wrote it down probably mm-hmm. wrong, I put Coup with K-U. I thought it was some sort of weird Asian thing. Uh, now I'm thinking no. about it. I realize it's probably C-O-U-P. It is right. C-O-U-P. Is that correct? As in oh, Coup d'etat. Yeah. Yes, of course. As not as not in, Coup. I was thinking it was some Asian. I'm like, Coup Rebellion. Nor, oh, okay. Nor is it Coup as in chicken coop. <laughs> nor, nor the car. <laughs> Right. Uh, the type of car, yeah. That's right. um, but it is in fact the French uh, form of coup, as in coup d'état. Um, coup Rebellion G64. It plays almost identically to coup, with the difference that uh, there are a whole bunch of different roles rather than having coup. Uh, you know, it's got a very set number of roles, and the expansion you can kind of swap in one class for the other, so to speak. This one's got a whole bunch of different roles. I don't know exactly how many. I don't think it's 54, despite the name. I'm not sure when 54 comes from. Uh, maybe it is 54. Uh, but what you'll do is you... Typically in Coup, you've got five classes of cards. And you've got three cards of that class. And so you're trying to figure out who owns what. It's a bluffing game and a deception game. Oh, is that the one that I that I was doing the rules? I was playing like the, the rule person for before I left? Uh, no, you were playing um, One Night Resistance. Oh, or okay. One Night uh, Rebellion. Which and I'll that's the one that you're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. Yeah. But they're, um, kind of, they're related. Though. They are related. They're in the same universe. Same universe, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what you do at the beginning of the game is you pull five random um, roll cards, class cards, if you will, uh, and then those determine what the rules of that game are going to be. So while it plays identically to Coup, each time you're going to have a different set of possible interactions because you have five different roles that people can claim. Uh, and so they add some like really neat twists, if you've ever played Coup, um, some really cool mechanics that you might not have seen before. Uh, for example, uh, in our game we had <clears throat> the Lawyer, which allows you to um, when the you, lawyer, yeah. When you claim the dystopian lawyer, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you claim the lawyer, um, basically you can do so when someone's eliminated from the game and you get to take all their money. Uh, so if someone had, for example, you know, seven coins in the game and they're eliminated by someone else, then you get to say, "Hey, I'm the lawyer. I'm going to take all that money." Um, unless, of course, somebody challenges. Not you. a very good lawyer. <laughs> they still got put away. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you know what? Even bad lawyers get paid. <clears throat> That's <you> true. <laughs> uh, so there are some really interesting mechanics in there, and I'm cur- I'm interested to keep playing more, um, just because each game is going to be a little bit different. Um, or you can sort of sit down, you know, have the five roles and play several rounds with those same ones to sort of see if you can explore that particular uh, combo. Uh, but it promises to have a lot more um, 
variance in its feel as compared to Ku. Whereas in Ku, I think you tend to fall a bit more into, um, you know, you have the same five types of cards, and so people are going to play them very specific ways. Like, oh yeah, they always claim to be the Duke round one. That sort of thing isn't probably going to happen in this quite so much. That makes sense. So, the other game, uh, also in the same universe, is uh, One Night Re- uh, One Night Revolution, which is uh, very heavily based upon One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Where if you've ever played Werewolf, it's where you've got um, basically citizens of a town. You've got um, people who are secretly werewolves, and the werewolf's goal is over the course of multiple nights to kill off a bunch of humans until they're the last survivors, or the humans are trying to kill off all the wolves before. Um, the wolves can kill everyone else. In this one, it's only one round. It's one night. Um, but you have uh, rebels, which are basically the townsfolk, and you've got informants, which are basically the werewolves. You're trying to out the informants so that they can't foil the rebels' plot to do this revolution. Um, and everyone has a specialist role that they have to perform at some point during the night, and you sort of go around in clockwise order. Um, and then based on uh, what everyone claims that they are, uh, you tried to deduce, um, like for instance, I, I played the thief and I was a rebel thief. And sometimes whether you're a rebel or an informant changes what you're supposed to do with your card. Um, I swapped someone's ID and was able to look at it. And so I was able to say, okay, so here's what I did. And I know based on that, these things, and then everyone sort of claims what they want to claim. And you, uh, try to figure out, uh, who you want to vote off the island, so to speak, who you want to eliminate, and if you eliminate one of the informants, the rebels win. If you don't eliminate any informants, then the informants win. Yeah, I, I actually, I didn't, technically I didn't play this game. I just sort of was doing like, I was kind of like the rules boss going through for a round before I had to take off for the night. But um, it seemed interesting. But the one thing that kind of bugged me was that you, the rebels would still win if they eliminated one of the informants, but you still have another informant or possibly more out there. Mm-hmm. That seemed very odd to me that, you don't have to get rid of all the informants. Yeah. It's just you have to find just one, mm-hmm. and then you win. It just kind of seems, to from like just the the the, the backstory mm-hmm. that you gave, it doesn't mm-hmm. seem like it makes a lot of sense. to still have other informants there. Narratively, you could sort of extrapolate that if you nab one, you could probably get the information about the other out of them. There's a lot of different yes. ways you can sort of uh, do that, but it's it's meant essentially as a one round game. It's designed to be a one rounder, um, a lot like Resistance and kind of the way that you're trying to deceive people and hide your identity. Um, but uh, it's meant to just be kind of one round with one round of deduction and then just play again. So um, Now, is this the same company that released Werewolf? Uh, that I don't know. And I'm not sure what their relationship as the designers are. I'd have to look that up. Because that, that's the same company that does Dixit, the board game Dixit, or card game Dixit, really. And the uh, boards and cards? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. I'm kind of enjoying the idea of short, quick series. There's a lot of those are out now. You know, they get funded for a half season, that kind of thing. Like Better Call Saul. Yeah, actually, I got caught up with Better Call Saul, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. So, um, good, good call on that one, Jim. Thank you. Um, but the one that I decided to pick up, and I think is thematically appropriate for our uh, scary episode, spooktacular. Yes, yeah, spook. Uh, it is actually Fear of the Walking Dead. Which has, is a sort of confusing title to start with. Um, and, and you saw the whole the whole series. Right? I saw the whole I, series. I saw the pilot and it didn't really grab me. At least the character specifically. Didn't right. Really now grab is, it, me. is it fear of or just fear the? I think it's fear it's the. Fear the Walking Dead. That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. And and they do a neat thing with the intro graphic. And I think this is actually one of the strengths of the show, which is goofy that it would just be this one thing. Uh, that you see the word fear and you don't see the Walking Dead underneath it, and it's kind of like uh, you know. Corrosive, uh, and then it then falls away, mm-hmm. and then you know you can say, "Oh, no, I'm fearing now. I know what I'm fearing." <laughs> um, and, and it's it's kind of symbolically that's that's it, it gets to you after you see it about ten or twelve times. You realize that's exactly what's going on. The Walking Dead aren't the prominent thing in the show. Um, now they're there, and you've got you know zombie face eating and, and all that stuff that you would expect to have in order to have the fear for the Walking Dead, but. What I really liked about it was you get to see the panic and, and all of that that ensues that you missed from um, Rick The Walking being, Dead Rick being in a coma. Rick's in a coma yeah. and he wakes up. Now, the interesting thing to me is this. Um, I read all of The Walking Dead comics um, all the way up through basically the, the seven years or so, the, the first seven years of, of what they did. And, and I, I let it slide whenever the series came out because I didn't want spoilers. 
Um, not that I'm sure you, you could actually have spoilers. <laughs> it, <laughs> but it that deviates, shows, so the it show does. deviates, deviates pretty so much. far. And I think actually it deviates in some pretty good ways. In some wonderful I, ways. The comic really, to me, got, got to a point where I, you know, I stopped because I felt mm-hmm. like, um, oh geez, what, what is, what is the guy's name that does the, the series? Kirkman. Um, thank Robert you, Kirkman. Robert Kirkman. Yeah. Um, I think he, at a certain point he got to this where he's like just killing characters off for the shock value is my impression. Yeah, that could be it. And I'm pulling a Mark Martin. But yeah, what, I mean, yeah. And so I just got annoyed and I'm like, well, I'm just not going to read well, this. What story. I recommend anybody who has access to the original comics uh, do is actually go to the end, the very, the mm-hmm. very end. There's letters. And he has this great relationship with his fans and had them from the very beginning mm. where he would respond to letters and talk about his vision and talk about why he made the decisions he made and that kind of a thing in a way that you don't get from a lot of comics and you don't get from a lot of writers. Um, given that he's putting out, in theory, 12 issues a year, it didn't always happen, mm-hmm. um, but that that's actually a really long time to have to wait for, for the story arcs. Uh, if you get three story arcs a year, you're doing pretty well. Mm. You know, We're talking four, um, you know, four episodes in a story arc. Well, so this actually matches really well the half-season model in the television show. And hmm. he was heavily involved, pretty heavily involved, in uh, Fear of the Walking Dead. And so one of the things that was curious to me and odd to me was he always, from the very beginning of The Walking Dead, wanted to tell the story of what happened after the zombie apocalypse. Sort of a 28 Days Later kind of a mentality, rather than the, uh, oh, look, the zombies, we have to stop them. There is no and, stopping. And that's it's what already always, happened. Yeah, yeah, that's what I always found interesting about his approach with mm-hmm. uh, The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. So what he's done then is he actually moved to the other coast. He's gone to California here. This takes place in L.A. And is telling that story from before it's even a fear. Some people are getting sick. Some people are doing weird things. No one notices because they're in L.A. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually, you know, that's a thing. That's not uh, the tumor. <laughs> and what it ends up being is um, they, they cordon off about 12 zones. And we're, this is the story of one of the safe zones. And so there aren't any zombies inside of it. And it's really, it's the, the character drama of what's going on inside of this safe zone. Um, and it's only at the very end of it that they bust out and they have to go out into the wilds. And, and we're not really sure where they're going to end so, up. So is this a series where you're really in love with the concept, but you didn't like where the characters went? Or did you just, did you actually end up liking the characters? Because well, for me, I liked the concept, but I actually stopped after the pilot. And I might revisit it. Because the characters just didn't grab me. Keeping in mind that this is set in the Walking Dead universe, right? What you have to expect is that the characters will evolve. You have to. Um, so it depends on the writing team, though. It doesn't really share the same writing team. No, it doesn't. But that's still one of the core philosophies of the show. That's true. Once again, if you read the meta stuff, you know where they're trying to go with it. Mm-hmm. So they're not entirely supposed to be likable characters. Mm-hmm. What you've got is a broken family that has its own issues, and in, in the face of the zombie apocalypse they're going to have to work together or die and that's really what the long arc story is all about so if you're interested in that kind of a character development story you're going to like fear the walking dead if instead what you want is a heroic rick character who is just going to kick zombie butt then that's that's not what i meant i meant i didn't mean i didn't like them in the sense of i didn't think they were good people i meant they didn't interest me at all I'm fine if they're terrible. Like, I'm fine with terrible characters that are horrible people. Mm-hmm. Terrible in terms of horrible people, as long as they're interesting. I just didn't think any of them were interesting. That was my problem. With are you them. talking about the actors or the writing? Well, the way the characters were written. Okay. Not the, I mean, the actors, I mean, it's just, they, the actors can only do as much. I didn't recognize the actors from anything else, so I can't comment on their acting ability. I mean, yeah, beyond enough. that. But, um, yeah, I mean, they can't, they can only do what, what they're given. Well, I'll give you an example then um, to wrap it up. And that is, um, one of the characters is a young man who is a drug addict. Hmm. And um, at the beginning, we can't tell whether or not there, there's zombies going on or if it's a, it's a drugged out um, drug house thing. Hmm. And um, towards the end of it, basically, their salvation comes from the fact that he is a druggie, which is really, really interesting. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Um, and, and the person who uh, is going to end up saving them in the second half of the first season, the only reason they met is because he was pulled away because he was in detox. Really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a short series, so I think I might go ahead and I might. It's probably worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, watched it while washing the dishes a couple nights in a row. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So before we move on to our meaty topic, uh, we do have a Mobile Minute that is going to sort of tie in, lead us into it. Doc. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about, well, 
in, in prep for our up and coming uh, interactive fiction discussion, I've actually been playing with a lot of stuff on phone, on, on like the iStore, to see what is out there. And there's actually a surprisingly large amount of it that's available for free. And the one that I found that I, I thought was really compelling, put it that way, was Creatures Such As We. And the thing that I liked about this particular story was that it's a story within a story, at least in part. You start as a guy on the moon who works for the tourist bureau, um, has a very boring job that he pretty much hates, but his only form of escape is to play video games. And of course, being the future, they're a little more immersive than ours. You put on the helmet, you sit in the chair, whatever. Uh, but his favorite is one that has just come out called Creatures Such As We. And you play as a zombie, and uh, within the story of that, you at the very beginning of this text-driven narrative, you're at the end of the game uh, that he is playing, and he's not satisfied with the ending. And as he leaves his pod to go welcome the tourists, who should it be but the developers of the game? So what's interesting is then he restarts in, quote, story mode, and between activities where you actually can talk to the developers of this fictional game while on the moon, which is a cool setting, uh, you can also befriend them. There's even an option for romance, and you can go through and with, with the developers. With one of the developers, yeah. Is there also an option for a bromance? Wait, actually, it, yes. <laughs> wait, but if you're a creation of the developer and you're having a romance with the developer, is that incest? You're not a creation of the developer. I thought you were. No, no, you're a guy who works on the moon. Oh, I thought you were. He's playing their game. Oh, okay. That, okay. Thus, I the game within the game. I misunderstood. Okay. It's sort of like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, how that's a, a, f a fictional piece, or I guess a, a reference piece that actually exists within the fiction right. of exactly. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Same sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and by the end of it, um, there's different paths you can take, and you can befriend various people, and, and you know, danger happens, and all these other things, because it's the moon. Uh, but by the end of it, basically, you're answering the question, the, the deep philosophical gamer's question, who really is in control of the ending? Is it the developer, or is it the player? And who should be? Um, and it's a very, very cool way of bringing that piece out, almost, almost kind of apologetically within the context of uh, gaming discussions. Well, you know, should it be this way or should it not? The case for headcanon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, we're we're now going to uh, transition right into our meaty topic, and today we've got suspense, horror, and fear in games. Uh, related to our spooktacular special. Bring up the maggot filled meat. Yes, precisely. Uh, the, the bowl of the bowl of uh, peeled grapes. <laughs> you were just in time for dinner. <laughs> so uh, and we've talked some about this, and I think with games, it's it's a lot different, or not a lot different, but there are some differences in terms of how you can you can portray suspense and, and create a sense of fear and anxiety in a player. Um, different from how you might approach that in a movie. Uh, I know when we started talking about this, Doc, you had some ideas about that. Do you want us to lead us off? Well, yeah. I mean, I see it as being pretty um, categorical. I think we can look at this as, you know, some waffles and, and figure out what goes in each thing. Oh, for, yeah. for example, there's suspense. There's suspense games. Um, and those are very, very different than something that is like, oh, I don't know, the, the dooms or the quakes um, where you've got scary settings. It's a bit like in movies where you've got the difference between a suspense movie and a horror movie. Right. Um, I would even point to, say, Quentin Tarantino, who gets um, criticized for all the violence in his films. But really, he makes exploitation films. He doesn't make horror films. And if you compare, you know, in buckets of blood, which I think is the, uh, the standard unit of measurement for, uh, for film, <laughs> uh, how many um, B.O.B.s, how many Bob's? Uh, are in a Tarantino film versus in, say, a slasher film. And you're going to find that it's tenfold in the slasher film. And yet those aren't criticized for being so violent in the same way. Right. Because it's an expectation. Mm -hmm. So I guess when you frame it like that within uh, games, which, which is the more um, compelling for fear? In terms well, of fear, I think it. I think it varies. I mean, you bring up a good a, a good example when you're talking about, say, Doom, which I think I would say you could definitely say has has horror qualities to Absolutely. it. Absolutely, because you're you're in this you're in this space as this you know space marine, mm -hmm. and some people like to think of of 
FPSs, particularly earlier FPSs, run and gun FPSs like Doom, as this um, oh you're di- you're disempowered character and you're running around you're blowing things up. But actually, it, Doom can be a very terrifying experience because oh, yeah. very quite often you are pretty much un- like under under undergunned. That's not a term, but you're outgunned essentially yeah. by by the demons that you're that you're encountering. You have to be tactful. Yeah, you have to be very tactful. You have to be careful with your ammo. Um, you have you have to look for for better weaponry because and and. They do a really good job, even in the very first Doom, of using like the sounds of the enemies. Each of them have a different sound. Oh, yeah. uh, like that one, uh, the one, the stampeding one. The first time you run into the one that kind of like stampedes and runs at you, that's yeah. like pink and and it takes a lot of hits to kill. It makes this like growling sound and this like like shuffling with its feet. Mm-hmm. And when you first hear it, the first time you know you don't see it at first. You just hear it, and it's above you in this like roof area. Mm-hmm. And you don't know how to get up there, and you're not sure what it is because you haven't met this thing yet. That's right, and it's. Terrifying, yeah. And you know it's coming. You know at some point you're going to have to kill this thing, but you don't know where it is. And eventually, you get up into the top roof, and the lights all go out. Right. And you're and I, I still remember this so vividly. And this is a game from from you know the mid nineties. Yeah. Or, or I think maybe even early nineties. Early nineties. Well, if you're talking about Doom One, yeah. I'm talking about Doom One. This whole scene happens in it Doom One. It was like ninety two, ninety three. Yeah. And it's it's frightening. You get up there and. You don't know where this thing is. I mean, of course, eventually you do get you you, you can kill it. Hopefully, if, especially if you have a. Sh- I think at that point they also make sure to give you a shotgun while yeah. you're up there, so you're able to actually oh, kill it. Shotty was awesome, but it takes several shots, and it's just this. And but all of them have their own little sounds. You can start to identify what enemy is coming based mm-hmm. on sound, and I think that's a big thing that games do pretty well is um, to to sort of. And one of the things, one of the triggers for fear is letting you know, oh, hey, if I hear the sound, and, you know, they do this a lot with boss fights, too. Yeah. But, like, um, they, you hear this sound, and you go, you identify it as, oh, something bad is coming. Like, even go back to Legend of Zelda on mm-hmm. the net, and you hear the sound that the boss makes when you're near the boss room. That kind of, like, panting sound. Yeah. And you know, you, gar- you start to get tense, and your palms start to sweat just a little bit more, because you know, uh-oh. The boss is coming. I better be careful. I think sound's a big part of it because you look at films, music is very important to suspense and to horror. Mm-hmm. You look at a horror film without the music and it's actually quite dull um, and not very suspenseful at all. But because the music is doing the... You're, you're just like, it's like, what's coming? What's coming? Something's about to happen. And what do you yeah. think about that that repetition too? Almost like a heartbeat is what a lot of these are, are similar to. Yeah. Um, especially, Legend again, that Legend of Zelda boss sound really is almost like a heartbeat. That's kind oh. of a telltale heart thing, you know. Your mm-hmm. your body will change its rhythm to match that, um, and so it'll actually cause your heart to beat faster. Just in and of itself, kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so the the full sensory experience, I think, is part of it. Sights, sounds, expectation. Um, but I, I guess what I really want to to get at is with you guys. What it, what kind of games really scare you? When was the last time you were really scared in a game and, and you just gave great early experience but does that early experience hold up it might for you because you're a fan of retro games but i'm not sure it would for your your average gamer nowadays i'd love to to know uh, whether or not if, if you put somebody who was a you know hardcore gamer with doom in their hands whether or not that would that that experience would hold up for them but i gotta tell you the last time I was really, truly good and scared in a game probably was three or four years ago um, playing Minecraft. Back when creepers were genuinely scary in Alpha. I have not been that scared in a really long time. And I don't know, people might laugh at me for that, but um, I had stuff. And if I died, I was going to lose that stuff. Yeah, and that was meaningful. I think having something to lose has a lot to do with it. Um, I, yeah, and I, I think too we ought to differentiate perhaps, and maybe it's the same thing. So maybe that's something we can discuss: the difference between tension and fear, and being like you know legitimately scared. I, because there are a lot of times in games when I'll feel tense and I'll feel nervous with tension, but feeling scared is something I've experienced in a long time. And I'll, I'll sort of go back to I think the last time that I can think of that I really felt scared in a game was um, when I was very young, which maybe youth has something to do with it too, um, that lesser ability to differentiate between real danger and virtual danger. Because virtual danger doesn't really scare you, mostly. Right. Or at least it doesn't me anymore. But when I first played uh, Marathon on the Macintosh, 
Um, this was from the this is Bungie, the people who made mm-hmm. uh, Halo. Yeah. Um, they had this first person shooter. It was kind of in the graphical style of Doom, a little bit more advanced, but yeah, it, it came out of like, a little bit later. Yeah, it, was, it was sort of like the pseudo three D, mostly two D sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It was closer to Quake, I think, mm-hmm. in terms of graphics. Mm-hmm. It was a few years um, later, and. Part of it was just that I didn't really know how the game worked. I was very much feeling my way through it, and I also wasn't very good at it. Um, but you start off in this like really tiny claustrophobic hallway. It's basically the loading bay for a shuttle that you just landed on the ship with. And everything is dark and everything is silent. And you might hear the shuffling of the feet of the aliens that come after you. You take a few feet forward, they turn the corner and come after you. And it's kind of like this, like, oh, God, you have to try to take them out with your mm-hmm. pistol. But I think, I think that counts mm-hmm. as... As fear. Mm. Oh, it does. I, I do this think, is this is the last time I felt. Oh, okay. Fear, is what I'm saying. Because I do think that when you were saying tension and fear differentiate, mm. I do think they're related. Mm. Um, and I, I do think that that if you're when you when you experience that tension, I do think it can lead to fear. Mm. Um, and I do think you kind of have to have that tension before you can have the all out like fear mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. Um, another example similar to that, and I think there's a lot of good examples in some of these uh, you know first person shooters because that first person perspective i think helps push you and immerse you in in the game so you're more likely to feel like you're there therefore yeah, it's more you're like you're yes and sure. you're more likely to be scared another good example of um, um oh system shock 2 have y'all played system shock 2 no um it, it is uh by doc was not and again Pre- my precursor to precursor bioshock. to bioshock mm-hmm. and i'm keep blanking on names right now and what was his name and i can see his face in my head the guy who did who does Bioshock. Ken Levine. Like, Ken Levine. Thank you. Ken Levine. So he also did System Shock 2. And Bioshock is thought of as a spiritual successor. System Shock 2, at many points, is a terrifying game. Mm-hmm. Because, and one, another one of the reasons for this is this somewhat similar to Doom, except at a certain point in Doom, even though you get, you are facing more powerful enemies, you also get more powerful stuff. And you never quite reach that ridiculous Duke Nukem level where you're so much more overpowered that you're not afraid. But you do start to get a bit more comfortable. Right. But in, in System Shock 2, that's not really the case. You always feel like you're kind of underpowered for what's going on. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of these little, you know, robotic or monstrous creatures that are just unrelenting. And they have this, this um, inhuman quality to them that makes them terrifying and you're just you're essentially in this abandoned space station and you don't know um exactly what went wrong in this space you just know that you probably shouldn't be here because everything that you seem to encounter wants to kill you and um that's kind of all you kind of have to know for the backstory to it there's a lot more to it within the game and yes of course because it is older there's certainly some antiquated uh gameplay elements to it but i do think it's worth playing through in terms of that, that fear um Another game I do think is worth talking about, too, is Bioshock. I do think that, that Bioshock, yeah. the original um, in particular, does a pretty good job of having some pretty scary moments. I, I think it's really important to note, though, that some games have scary replay value and some don't. The, right, once you already know it's there and you see it coming, you may, it may not have Bioshock some Bioshock is one of the few games, few, few, few games, that I have played entirely through more than once. I've played that game all the way through three times. Um, and that's probably my record in terms of games I've played through, except for maybe some of the early Zeldas. But um, that that game wasn't scary the second time I played it. In fact, it was interesting. I, I got a little more immersed into the, the, the characters and things like that that were going on, and my heart wasn't beating quite, quite as hard in some of those scary moments. Now, there's still some wonderful set pieces. Um, anytime that you're up to your knees in water and you know that there's... Um, uh, splicers that are going to come at you and, and you walk into a room you're like I know those guys are coming to life I know they're coming to life ah they came to life uh, you know, <laughs> th- in that sense I think that, that it's wonderful but the uh, call it the beats the mm-hmm. horror beats um, don't always hold up in, in some games uh, I think so are we noticing a, a trend between a lot of these games that we're mentioning where we are um, one lone person and we're in a hostile environment and there's not a lot of other characters to interact with the things that we that we have around us to interact with are either unknown inhuman or want to kill us no, i think there's something i mean because i mean yeah. that's you know i mean yes there is there is a little bit of character interaction with actual human characters in bioshock mm-hmm. but it's very rare you, you're still in this space where it's essentially this you know un, underwater um, community that has now gone wrong and now there's like these right. undead things that are after you and all that. And it's the same thing with Sex and Doom, you're like a lone space marine on like, you know, on, I think you're on Mars, I want to say. And well, that kind of, or like a space station. Going back to the yeah. Bioshock example though, like, 
I found that there are times when I would sort of acknowledge that this is a scary scenario, but I never felt frightened. And I don't know if maybe like that doesn't really matter if like, really? the player you, feels frightened. I mean, but even even I mean, they, it could just be because I sort of knew that it was supposed to be dark, but, and I might just be like jaded or desensitized to it. But after playing, inside, they, yeah, they, they even had jump scares in that one that I actually thought were pretty effective. Well, I mean, but like when the splicers, mm-hmm. like you don't think that there's splicers in that room, or like you think that they're dead or something, and then all of a sudden, or like that one. I think it was like some some woman with a mask or something on, yeah. and like jumps out at like you or think. Art. The woman that was talking, like, in a baby carriage, and you think you might have run into an actual person, uh-huh. and she's just talking to it, and then all of a sudden it turns around, and it's, like, this splicer that's, like, completely insane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember that moment, but for... Or the guy with the masks. That was probably the scary... The one with the weird mask guy who did all the paintings, yeah. and that whole room. Yeah. I gotta go back and play it. It's I mean, been a while the, since I've played it. There were elements that were creepy, but I don't remember, like, really feeling scared, even if I got really? kind of, like, a jump just because, like, you know, if something jumps out and you react to it. Do you I never scared from, you, from movies? Not usually, no. I mean, I just, I just don't feel dread playing games. The last time I felt dread is, like I said, playing Marathon when, you know, it was all, uh, very silent and I, as a player, didn't even know where I was or how to do things. Mm-hmm. So you're very, you know, intimately relating to what the character's going through and then you hear the... <laughs> of the aliens coming at you. It's like, okay, where are they? I don't know. That's the last time I remember feeling dread, and I was like five. Chris, we're just, I, I think Doc and I are just not as manly as you are, I guess. No, I guess <laughs> not. I mean, <laughs> sissies. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave. You guys come back to me next week and let me know yeah. if you sort of worked through your problems. And, did uh, you play Dead Space, either of you? I did not play Dead Space. Oh, that's one, that's one, that's actually been on my list for a while to play, because I, I've heard it's very, it can be pretty terrifying, but I I've it. not actually played it. I absolutely Oh, really? It. Yeah. Yeah, um, Phil Johnson, who's been on the show before, mm-hmm. loaned me that one. Um, the whole stack of three, in fact, with the idea that um, I was going to love it, that the, the set pieces were great, and that it was scary, and it was fun, and that sort of thing. I couldn't get into the mechanics. Um, the, the the things that you're trying to kill are so overpowered, and the, the ammo is so sparse, and the mechanics, you really, really have to be good at shooting them that I ended up having to reset, rewind, reload so many times that I lost the immersion. It's just frustrating. Well, it's not scary. Well should, anymore, yeah. Yeah. well, should we talk about then related to mechanics? Should we talk about Resident Evil? And that's because, where I was going with Okay. That. There's probably something to do with flow f- theory here, I think, where like if you're repeating something over and over again, it becomes frustration and not scary. Yes. It's not dread. Whereas you, you want to be making progress steadily enough yeah, not steadily enough that you don't feel like there's a threat. You need to feel like there's a threat of losing something, of dying, of having to reset. Of almost dying. Mm-hmm. Of almost dying. But at the same time, you need to be going forward quickly enough that it doesn't become too repetitive. Exactly. And, I mean, I hate to keep bringing back Doom, but I think that's something that Doom did very well. It set you up for success, but also made you terrified and think that you were about to die. Mm-hmm. And if you pick the right difficulty level for your skill level, like what the, your experience level with the game you would have that sort of experience. I mean, yeah. yes, technically you could go straight into the hardest difficulty and you'd probably just die every time. But if you did it right, it actually was, and just played it on normal and you're like about an average player, mm. it does a really good job of, of setting you up to feel like you're always about to die, but you often wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You'd often just barely get by and you'd almost die and you'd have that like, your face would be all bloody in the bottom bottom oh, of the screen. Yeah, and that you'd, icon was great. You'd, like, you'd have that, yeah. some sort of like panting or some sort of sound, I forget the sound, uh-huh. where you would almost be dead, mm-hmm. and it would be so scary because you knew, oh my god, something could jump out of me anywhere and kill me in one hit. Um, it does a good job with that, mm-hmm. but if you're talking about some of these, like, um, you know, something like, say, a Resident Evil, and Resident I think Evil. So, several, some of them are worse at it than others. I remember enjoying Resident Evil 4 quite a bit, mm-hmm. and I think that one was a... They improved the mechanics somewhat to the extent that it was a little bit more actiony, mm-hmm. but it still had that um, difficulty to turn difficult like turning around on a dime. It wasn't really like a shooter per se, um, but it had a little bit more shooter mechanics to it. I still love the game, yeah. But I thought there were there were some moments in there that were um, genuinely like somewhat frightening, just because somewhat scary, just because you feel like. Um, you don't have, you're not well equipped to succeed. Yeah. So I think that's maybe a little bit, a, a part of it. Well, this brings me back to my sort of tension versus dread question, which is I've definitely felt times when I'm playing games when like I'm on a boss fight and I know I'm one to hit away from dying and I just need to get one more hit on the boss. And it's like, can I just survive long enough to get this? And you're very tense and you're like, you know, every moment like you'll 
depending on sort of the game, it might like feel like it's speeding up or slowing down, but you're like really focused and you're really like, it's like, I gotta, I gotta do this right, right now, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I've definitely felt tension and I felt like intensity from games where you're kind of on the edge like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not sure how that, I mean, I'm sure it plays into a feeling of dread or of being scared in the game. Um, but I'm not sure kind of like if there's sort of what, what, how do we define the difference in player experience from being just tense versus being scared? And maybe it's just subjective. I think, I think it's, I think it's partially subjective, but I think a big part of that is how immersed you are in the experience. I mean, if you're just, if you're playing it, if you're just, this is a game and this is a, this is my character in this game and I don't want to die. That could be tension, but if mm -hmm. you're if you're so immersed in it where you feel like this is your experience, mm -hmm. and I have a tendency to do that, and that's po probably part of it is that maybe you don't. I, I, I think you, I, have, you may struggle to make mm -hmm. those connections with me. Like when I watch a movie or mm -hmm. when I play a game, um, if it's done well, mm -hmm. I will get so immersed in what's going on that if the, if even in a film too, if mm -hmm. if that character is in a situation where they're you know terrified or whatever, I will feel that too. <clears throat> mm -hmm. maybe I get uh, really into it, and a game even more so because I'm I'm that character. I mm -hmm. feel like. Especially first person, I feel like I am I am this person, and if I don't want them to die because I don't want to die, yeah, and I don't want to see um, this to happen. Maybe as a designer and an author, I sort of more than most people might remove myself a bit from the experience. I'm always kind of analyzing as I'm playing, even if I don't really mean to. Um, even you know, I talk about how much I love tales um, or Telltale games, um, but I think even then. I'm almost thinking of it like role playing, where I am sort of thinking, how would my character do something, not mm -hmm. thinking, how would I do something. That's one of the things I love about those games, though, the Tales of series, is that if you sit there and you wait for too long and you don't say anything at all, it moves on without you, mm -hmm. and saying nothing is an option. Yeah, and so yeah, it's an also an, an interesting option in the Telltale games. Where it can be, yeah. Um, I, I love that playthrough of Walking Dead season one, mm. um, where you just always you just never say anything to people mm -hmm. and you just come across as the biggest jerk <laughs> really that's yeah. interesting you just every single choice you just don't say anything mm -hmm. and just like the re like the reactions and part of it is like you putting your own interpretation on it as you play mm -hmm. from what's happening but it's still you come across as this, this just this jerk because everyone's always asking you questions trying to get like you know trying to get you to console them give you some sort of advice all this kind of stuff and you're just you're just silent every time. You never I love it. Your it's great. Um, but, but yeah, but getting yeah. into the more the more suspenseful because we've talked we've talked about that dread and tension, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things I did want to talk about is the concept of um, in in games. This is something that games can do and movies cannot do uh, because games have uh, player agency and we we are actually playing and we do have some sort of control over what we're doing. Um, Removing that agency mm -hmm. can, do you think that can, or at least maybe removing is the wrong word, but limiting, uh, limiting what you can do. I think we talked about could the, give you yeah. that sense of could possibly bring bring you that mm -hmm. sense of fear. The last time we did Contribute our to it. last time we did our spectacular, I think we talked about disempowerment and how that was important to right. uh, yeah. horror games. And I do think that has something to do with it. The idea that um, you don't feel as in control as you ought to. And that might be a genre specific thing. If the expectation of a genre is that you're able to behave in a certain way and mm -hmm. suddenly you can't, um, that makes you uncomfortable just because it's not the sort of gameplay you're used to. Uh, Resident Evil being a good example, it's a basically a shooter. Survival um, horror, actually. Yeah, survival horror. But like, you know, especially the newer ones, it feels more and more like a shooter. But it changes things. Like it gives you less ammo or it makes you a little bit more fragile and you have to manage your health a little bit mm -hmm. uh, more strictly, that sort of thing. Um, just the fact that you're having to think about what looks to you like a familiar genre that differently uh, might be one of the things that kind of throws you off as a player and creates that sense. And Metroid is one of those. I mean, we talked about Metroid Prime earlier, but mm -hmm. the Metroid series in general has come from, its inspiration was from um, Alien, yeah. the original Alien movie. Mm -hmm. Um, was the original inspiration for and another one that's got that isolation mm -hmm. and yeah and yeah. it's supposed you're in this isolated environment you're one person you're just, I mean, in, in this alien environment and um, especially at the beginning you're very underpowered for what you what you have to face mm -hmm. it's kind of like doom in the sense that you get a little bit more comfortable as you go but for a while it's kind of like you're scraping by on what little you have mm -hmm. and actually i think um the original metroid even though the mechanics going back to them are very dated but it it did a good job for its time mm -hmm. Giving you that, even when you when you get very powered up, you still feel like 
there's still when you go to certain bosses or certain rooms mm -hmm. or when you're in Torian and you're fighting the Metroids, you still feel like, whoa, I can, I can just die any time. It's very, it, that, the music too contributes a lot to it and the sound design. Mm -hmm. And Metroid Prime does this really well too. With the, with a lot of the environment, some of the ways that you're that you experience some of the bosses, that kind of thing, you get this experience of um, this sort of isolated feeling, but also this feeling of, you know, no one's helping me. I'm in this isolate. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in this you know desolate environment, and things are out to kill me. There's no safety net. It's it's ha having allies says that there's someone else who can help me, uh, but when there's no safety net, that adds to that sense of tension. Mm -hmm. When they added that in Metroid Prime Three, that was one of the, even though I actually love the mechanics of Metroid Prime mm -hmm. Three, and I still liked a lot of the the the, the level design, mm -hmm. but adding those extra little characters in mm -hmm. there kind of it, it did feel make it did make the game feel very different. Yeah. Um, and even though like pretty much you end up having to fight all of them eventually, um, yeah, there's just something about that game that had a very different feel in general from um, Prime One and Two. Mm -hmm. Talk. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but what do you think about? Because we were talking about the this idea of like dis, disempowering the player to possibly lead, give you suspense, especially when, um, and, and, and we talk about suspense too. But what about um, possibly to get a little meta? You're you're running through a game, you get to a certain point, and suddenly the music changes. Mm -hmm. You see a little save icon or something on the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does this bring? Does, I mean, does this is this a suspenseful moment? I mean, it's 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 sort of a meta thing. You know, the, mu the music is changing. It's, yeah. it's non diegetic music, and you see something on the screen that, that represents. You know, that it's now saving. You know, uh oh, I'm at a checkpoint. The music is like ramping up into a little bit more ominous. Something's about to go down. Well, yeah, um, I think it plays on us as an audience of movies. Mm -hmm. The the music cue, especially. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and I, and I think it, if it's done right. Uh, you can actually prime people for um, that suspenseful moment in a way that makes it better, makes the experience better. Um, consider the telltale version of um, The Walking Dead, and I know season two is out. None of us have actually played season two. Which is, I played it. Have, oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then um, I own it and haven't played it. I know, it. I own it and haven't played it too. <laughs> so we definitely need to do this for, for a future uh, roundtable. But um, the, the idea of... Um, there being a group and that tension being there with the group, it, it kind of breaks the convention we were just talking mm -hmm. about. So I was thinking about that. What is it that, that the fear and the tension comes from in those moments? And it's not about you dying. It's about losing a party member. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because you, you feel connected to the other yeah. party in, members. In yeah. season one, I, I mean, I felt connected to um, and, and Clementine. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, yeah. Clementine. I felt connected to her and I didn't want her to, I honestly didn't care as much about the rest of them. Mm -hmm. But, and not just, not just her death, but more like, the way that she saw me, like, you yeah. know, I, I felt like I had to portray, I had to, you know, project this sort of character to help her character, you right. know, grow and accept what's going on. So right. I felt very much, um, you know, that sort of like fear of like, and that sort of like, um, I guess you could say responsibility as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So it was a very different thing. No responsibility, the most horrifying thing ever. <laughs> Which is <laughs> ironic because as I understand it, she can't die mm -hmm. and uh, without reloading and, and you must Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's that was my probably my biggest criticism, and it's it's long enough, old enough now. I don't think we really need to worry about spoilers, but that was. Do we the ever thing. worry about spoilers? No, but we normally just say it right beforehand. <laughs> um, but right that was the thing I really didn't like about um, season one. Otherwise, I really enjoyed it. But spoilers. That that thing at the end, where essentially you go into you're in the situation and you have literally no control. You're just going to get bitten, and there's nothing. And it, it, I thought it was pretty lame. Yeah. Um, I really, I felt like it gave you a chance to dodge in every other case, but yes. this one and, time. And yeah. also, I, I do feel, I do feel like that would have been fine to be an ending. That's fine mm -hmm. to have that happen, but I just felt like it shouldn't have forced that upon you. It would have been really interesting if mm -hmm. you could have had a very different ending where you I, actually survived. I did like though that if they are going to force you to get bit like that, that they give you a full episode for you to see how you'd behave knowing that you've been bitten. Yeah. And you can lie about it, or you can tell them the truth. No, no, that that was that was pretty cool, and I think I'm sure that's why they did it because that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Mm -hmm. They they give you these sort of choices, but then they always like, eh, not really, and they take you right back to yeah. the same point, and just because of how difficult it is to do that with voice acting. Um, well, to connect back to the back talk segment, uh, that's exactly what I was talking about with the idea of. There being authenticity, the in other words, the player has mm -hmm. the ability to stop something versus validity, which is the 
they're going to force a story point down your throat. And in this case, they had to force that story point or else the, the final chapter, wherein you are a bitten character, wouldn't have worked. Um, so maybe what they could have done is um, given a, a decision by which you could have been bitten different ways. Either bitten well, out of no fault of your mm-hmm. own or bitten um, because of something stupid you did. And then you're still bitten, but you're still bitten as a result of one or the other thing. And it changes the, the perception, you see. I would say that, but I'd also say... Because I know there's a moment where you can, like, something like cut off your arm or something along those mm-hmm. lines, but it doesn't matter either way. Yeah. But it should matter. It should. And that's another thing, too, where it's like, because it does matter in the Walking Dead universe. If, yeah, you, if, you, can, if you can cut off your limb quick enough, Fast enough yeah. you are okay. I mean, I mean yes, you, you've now lost a limb, and that's a huge negative, right. obviously, in this world, but you're okay. And that's something that I think would have been an interesting choice in the game that they could have included, where... Um, you can cut that limb off and now, now you'll survive, but maybe because of doing that, you're unable to do something else very yeah. important. You're game. not able to save Clem. For example, you're not able to save Clem. That would have been very interesting. That would have, your yeah. entire choice, you realize at a certain point where you have to help her, you have to like pull something off of her, or, like fight something off, and you only have one arm to do it. And you're, you, you've got to be going through your head, oh no, I shouldn't have chopped my arm off. And that's exactly you what know? I didn't chop yeah. my arm off. That would have been interesting. Because I, I was thinking, you know what, right now my mission is to save Clem, and I need both arms to do that. Yeah. But unfortunately, it does. It didn't matter. I felt I, that, that's the main point. It's like it's not so much that it happened. It's just that I. It, it felt like no matter what, they were going to get this to this. It was always going to come to this conclusion. This like break apart. Oh, but here it comes right back. Break apart. Ah, but we're going right back. Mm-hmm. And and there was to me there was too much of that. I, we're getting a little too a little bit off topic. But are we? I don't well, think we are. Maybe not. I, I think kind of like to start you know wrapping it up a little bit. Going back from kind of what I'm gathering from this is that mm-hmm. the times when we're more going to feel scared, be likely to feel scared, is maybe a couple of things or these things all in combination. One is sort of um, intimacy or immersion. Mm-hmm. That is, how much do you as a player feel like you are threatened? Uh, Minecraft is an interesting example because it's a very avatar sort of character Mm -hmm. and there's almost no narrative. So it really is just your experience Mm -hmm. and you've got a lot to lose if that creeper blows you up. Um, On the other end of the spectrum, you're not really so worried about yourself or you're removed as a player, but maybe you feel a connection to any of the characters, whether that be your player character, whether Mm -hmm. that be, you know, your companions and something like The Walking Dead. Well, one thing I actually think, and I know we're, we're about to get near our time limit, but the one thing that I did want to talk about just a little bit, because we haven't mentioned it at all, multiplayer games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And fear in multiplayer games. And, for example, you, um, you know, you were talking about, say, Minecraft, for for instance, which is a multiplayer game, but I was also thinking of something like, you know, an MMO, Mm -hmm. where you're in a, a PvP server, in particular, like World PvP. Sure, yeah. And say you're in, uh, for example, in World of Warcraft, and you're in Booty Bay. And you're a, you know, level 30-something character. And when you're in Booty Bay, because, you know, Horde and Alliance can both go there. Yeah, they can. And you're running around trying to kill something because you have to do quests around Booty Bay. You you will get those characters. It used to happen all the time in Vanilla WoW, the, like, six, level 60 rogues, essentially, that would be... And you'd hear that noise that, like, you know, when they go stealth. <laughs> and it would be utterly terrifying. Because you know... That, that there's a rogue around that is probably of the other faction, because if he wasn't, he probably wouldn't go into stealth. Mm-hmm. And now, and you know that you can never possibly beat them because they're much higher level. You just know at some point they're going to kill you. So it's like, what, what should I do? Should I try to run away? Should I try to keep fighting and then, like, hope they don't, you know... Well, there's, your, there's your audio cue again. And again, yeah. you know, so something like more... Not what it is that makes us feel scared, but, you know, one of the tools of enhancing that is anticipation. Um, there you go. If you don't know that something suspense. scary is coming, then yeah, you need suspense, I think, to have horror. Because if something just jumps out at you, you can be surprised, you can be shocked, but it's not really a scary experience mm-hmm. because you're just like, la, 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 nothing's wrong until something's wrong. Yeah, if you don't see it coming and you just get, say, like, you know, a hunter, like, shoots you one time and you die or something as he's running along a path and you never knew it was going to happen, and you don't feel afraid. You feel angry mm-hmm. that, you, that someone just, like, much higher level killed you, but you don't feel afraid but when you hear that that stealth noise you are afraid for a while there you're scared and then if you're if you're even really if they don't kill you it. by the way because there, there were some rogues that and actually i did this a few times too that i wouldn't even go there to kill people sometimes i just go there to go in and out of stealth yeah. around people that are like haunting because it would scare the hell out of them and then that, that's exactly what i was about to say is if you're playing it right <laughs> you make it so that sometimes that sound doesn't mean anything and then they start questioning 
Like they don't even know that like, oh, something's about to happen. Sometimes it's just like something could happen. I don't know. Is it going to happen? And then that adds even more to the suspense. Yep. Okay. Well, we've talked quite a bit about uh, suspense, horror, and fear in games. I think we we sort of had a, a very broad... Um, discussion. We talked about a lot of different games, though, and I think I think we, um, yeah, I think I think it was pretty productive. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think there are a lot of uh, sort of points that we could take and expand upon in future episodes. Lots of pins to be stuck, mm-hmm. and I'm sure we will because yeah. we're coming up on 50 here pretty soon. We are indeed. The 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 special uh, the 50th anniversary. Well, not exactly. 50th episode. 50th anniversary of of uh, podcast episodes. Yeah, there you technically. go. Technically, there you go. Something like that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Uh, but that should be fun. We're going to be doing that next week. Mm-hmm. So I hope you all will join us for that as well. And I hope you've enjoyed the spooktacular. The spooktacular. Spooktacular. Thank you. You can do much better than I can, Chris. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. Yes. Yep. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 49 of the BackwardCompatible.com Spooktacular. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to join this discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us which games have made you feel afraid, and why you think they did. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Ah, 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 ah. (laughs) Was that an owl from Sesame Street? Yeah, that was the count. I think that was the count. It was the count. Okay. That's not scary. He is extremely scary. He is educational. Math is not scary, Chris. Come on. You didn't take my math classes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm with you on that one.